stand on your feet. If you're joining us online, welcome to church. We're going to sing a new song. How many know that there's nobody like Jesus? Anybody? That's not enough people. I said, how many know there's nobody like Jesus? Hey, spoiler alert, there's a baptism this morning. Yeah. I'm going to teach you the song. Here it is. It says, Yahweh. Take it in vain. Try that. Two, three, six. Yahweh. That's it, church. Everybody sing it. Yahweh. Sing holy is your name. Holy is your name. I don't want to take it in vain. I don't want to take it in vain. Here we go. Everybody clap your hands. Come on. Yeah. Nobody like our God. Let's try it again. Here we go. Yahweh. Sing. Yahweh. Sounds good when we sing it together. Yahweh. Come on. Yahweh. Yeah. Holy is your name. Holy is your name. Yeah, I don't want to take it in vain. I don't want to take it in vain. Sing. Yahweh. Yahweh. Sounds real good in here. Yahweh. We sing. Yahweh. Holy is your name. Holy is your name. Hallelujah. I don't want to take it in vain. I don't want to take it. Here's the next part. It just says this. There will be no other God before you. Try that, church. There will be. Come on. There will be no other God before you. Here's the next part. There is no. So there is no one above you. No one beside you. Nobody like you. There will be no other God before you. My favorite part right here. It says, no one. One more time, there will be no other God before you. We say, come on. There will be no other God before you. Yeah. He's the first and the last. There will, there will be no other God before you. There is no one above you. Come on. There is no one above you. No one beside you. Nobody like you. There will to freedom. You say, no one, no one, no one. That's it. And who else can heal all our sins and diseases? You say, no one, no one, That's it. No yeah. And who else can walk, walk on the water? No one, no one, yeah. no one. Yeah. And who else can answer and 
answer my fire. Sing it. No one, no one, yeah. no one. And who else can bring down the tallest of giants? No one, no one, no That's the king. Come on. And who else can silence the roar of the liar? No one, no one. Let me ask you one more time. And who else is worthy, worthy of worship? No one. nobody like Jesus this next part we're going to sing it together this is the end of the song but this is our testimony I want you to sing this right here it says I searched and I found nobody like Jesus I searched and I found nobody like come on sing it I searched and nobody like Jesus I searched and I found nobody now lift your hands and sing it break down I searched and I come on nobody yeah I searched and I found your testimony. I searched and I found. Yeah, I searched and I found. Yeah. Oh, I looked and I found nobody like. Yeah. I looked and I found. Yeah. I looked and I found. Last time. I looked and I found nobody like Jesus. Can we give him praise in the room this morning?
of the faith in the room What the Lord can do What the Lord can do yeah. It's gonna happen Just let the way make it through He's gonna move Yes, He's gonna move so Can you imagine Can you imagine With all of the faith in the room What the Lord can do What the Lord can do Let the way make it through. He's gonna move. Yes, he's gonna move. Now throw your hands up and sing anything. Anything is possible. I need the church right through here. Come on. Anything is possible. Yeah. We believe that. Anything is possible. Who am I? Who am I? To deny what the Lord can do. Sing it again. Anything. Anything is possible. Anything, come on. Who am I? Who am I? Yeah, man. Sing it again. We sing anything, anything. If you need healing, anything is possible. Anything is possible. Who am I? coming up here um so i i talked to um i talked to two uh very good friends in the last week and those individuals have been used so powerfully by god in the last several decades and they're going through a significant season of transition and they on honestly like you know as they as, as you know they would say they're aging out and younger people are around and with more energy and more vitality and they can't travel like they used to travel or move like they used to move or this like they used to that and 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 there was a a, a word that I said to them he's not done with you yet he's not done with you yet and and maybe you've wondered if he's done with you and I just want to say to you he's not done with you I don't care how old you are He's not done with you. Last night at one of our gatherings, I met a woman in her 80s who's just now coming alive to the work of God. He's not done with you yet. Maybe, maybe this isn't about age. Maybe this is because you've gone too far. You, you've blown it too badly and you think you're beyond his reach. And I just want to say to you, dear friend, he's not done with you yet. And I just got to wonder how he might want you to participate in what he's doing in the world in the days ahead. Maybe it's here within our church community. Maybe it's serving within our church, within one of our ministries, within our new partnership with World Vision that we're starting. I don't know what it might be. Maybe it's, maybe it's a new way to, 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 to reach your neighbors. Maybe it's a new way to reach family. I have no idea what it might be, but I am convinced He's not done with you, friends. 
open your heart to God as we continue to sing. Would you trust him with this? Would you trust him with the trajectory of your life today? Open your heart to him. You're not done with me yet. You're not done with me yet. There's so much more to the story. There's so much more to your story. You're not done. You're not done with me yet. You're not done with me yet. Come on, touch your heart and sing. You're not done. You're not done with me yet. There's so much more. There's so much more to your story. You're not done with me yet. You're not done with me yet. There's so much more, come on. There's so much more to your story. You're not done with me. It's all my words for sure. I've got nothing new. How could I express? Anybody grateful? All my gratitude. I could sing these songs as I often do, but every song must end, and you never do. So I throw my hands and praise you again and again, so that.
nothing else fit for me except for a heart singing hallelujah hallelujah Jesus it doesn't seem like enough in light of who you are and what you've done it's not much at all God, it's what you desire from us. It's what you ask is simply just to bring hearts full of love and adoration and gratitude, hearts that offer you worship. Even though we're broken, even though we're imperfect and we mess up. God, it's just what you ask for. And so we offer it to you today. We offer what we have, we offer who we are. And we pray that our worship would be pleasing to you, that it would bless your heart, that it would fill your throne room and bring you glory and honor. We join our voices this morning with all of those in heaven to praise your glorious name. sing this song. If you know it, I grew up singing it. I think it's a great way to end this set. We sing it. So, praise the name of Jesus. Praise the Jesus, we pray. Amen. Friends, thank you for worshiping with us. You may be seated. Jesus. Baptism is a beautiful symbol of what God has done in us, how we've died to ourselves and how we've been raised to new life in Christ. But there's another symbol that it conveys as well. It's the simple image of being washed clean. And our friend that you're about to meet has been washed clean by Christ. And this is one of the most important moments in his life and we get to be here. So as he comes up out of the water, let's celebrate with him. And I mean, let's celebrate you guys. This is a step of faith that he's taking today. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for Sam. We thank you that he is following you. Lord, that he has surrendered his life to you. Lord, we thank you for leading him in this step of faith. And God, we pray that as he comes up out of the water, Lord, not only would he hear the celebration around him, but Lord, would he experience your blessing, your strength, that he would see that his feet are planted on solid ground. And Lord, we pray that the trajectory of his faith journey in you would be solid and marked by this moment. We pray in the name of Jesus, amen. I am absolutely thrilled to see God on the move with so many young people in our church community. It's just such a delight. And I've got to tell you, Sam's the real deal. And, and God's, God's got a hold of his life, and I can't wait to see what he's going to do in and through Sam in the days ahead. 
Sam asked me to read a little bit of, of his testimony to you. Sam writes this. He says, I've been so blessed to be raised in a community of strong believers my whole life, with my parents, school, and friends. It wasn't until the last couple years that I truly recognized the significance of my faith and the overwhelming sacrifice of what Jesus has done on my behalf. I lived a life of sin, shame, and guilt, trying to seek the light, yet being in the dark. Coming to college, I was presented with the choice of following Christ or the ways of the world. Because of God's great love and mercy, He deserves all glory. Because of all that He has done for us, we in turn are called to lay our lives down for Him. Being in spiritual community this year has pushed me into vulnerability, growth, and ultimately a more fruitful relationship with God. Because of this, I want to follow Jesus' commandment of baptism, surrendering, declaring, and committing my life to Christ. He ends with Romans chapter 7, verses 24 and 25. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. You know, the stereotype is you go to college and you throw away your faith. Or at least put it on pause. Sam's done the opposite. And friends, I got to challenge you, no matter where you are in, in, in this season of life, no matter where you are, uh, age, circumstances, whatever the case, follow Sam's lead. Throw yourself into the life of God. You can trust him. You can trust him, dear friends. My friend, Sam, I baptize you now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. you're joining us online we're going to take a quick break if you are here for the following jesus class head downstairs keep it going bye Congratulations, Sam. That is so awesome. Thank you for sharing this with us. We're so thrilled. 
We're so thrilled for you. Good morning. Hi, I'm Mackenzie, like she just said. Hello, hello. I am honored to serve as Capitol's executive pastor. And at this point in the service, I have some announcements to share with you. And we'll also pray over the offering. But it's a big day, right? We've got Sam's baptism. We got a few things happening right now. Jesus 101 is downstairs. We have the Capital Cares info meeting right after the 11 o'clock service. We have a family service tonight at 5 p.m. Bring your match cards. And I'm not even in announcements yet. Okay, there's a lot happening. But first, um, special welcome to anyone who's new. Please grab a connection card. We would love to get to know you. We're so glad you're here. If you're in the room, they're in the seat back in front of you. If you're online, you can find it at capitalchurch.com. We'd love to help you get connected and plugged into the life of this community. Now, I do want to pause and just take a moment to say thank you for giving. Thank you for investing your financial resources into the life of this church. It is what makes this vision we have of leading people to become Christ-centered disciples possible. So if you'd like to give, if you'd like to join us um, in this work we're doing, you can give online at capitalchurch.com slash give. You can give through the Capital Church app. It's called Church Center, and you just search by zip code, and you can find Capital Church. Give right through the app. Or um, you can text a gift to the number on the screen. Also, you can drop a gift in the buckets as they go by in just a moment. But truly, we are so grateful for you enabling us to do ministry through these financial resources. So hosts, come on forward. And if you all would, join your hearts with me. Let's pray. God, thank you for this beautiful day. And as we celebrate all that you are doing, God, we stop and we celebrate the truth that your mercies are new right now for each one of us whether we got baptized today like Sam or it's been a long time we've been journeying with you or we're just getting to know you, God, your mercies are new for us today and we thank you. And God, I pray right now um, that we would experience that abundant grace as we lean into your word and, and apply it to our lives, as we discern how to use our time and our energy and our resources, Lord. Lead us by your grace. And I pray your blessing on these gifts, that they would be multiplied and used to further your kingdom, and to lead more and more people into Christ-centered discipleship to experience those beautiful mercies each and every morning. God, we thank you for the opportunity to join you in the work you are doing in this way. So be glorified in every dime and every dollar. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, my first announcement for you is about our small groups launch. We launch a new season of small groups uh, the week of April 7th to 13th. So you've got a few weeks to kind of look at your calendar and discern if this is a good season for you to jump in to spiritual friendship. If you have been interested in leading a group, okay, we have a leader's interest meeting on March 24th at 1245 downstairs in room 110. Um, We'd love to share with you what leading a group looks like, right? It's not signing up for life. It's not signing up to have perfect theology and a perfect house. No, 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 no. Okay. Leading a small group actually is one of the best ways to cultivate your faith and to cultivate your theology and to find real life faith-sharing friendships. So we really would love to connect with you about leading a small group or get you plugged into one in a few weeks. Now, speaking of a few weeks, Easter is two weeks away. We would love to see you at one of our Easter weekend services. Um, Saturday service schedule is our normal schedule, 5 p.m. in Park City, 645 here in Salt Lake. Um, On Sunday morning, we are adding a service. So we will have three Sunday morning services. Service times are shifting a little bit. 8 30 10 and 11 30 so mark your calendar bring a friend our hope in adding the service is that you can bring a friend you can bring your family and it's still a comfortable experience we know those of you in those folding seats in the cafe thank you for being here I know it's not as comfortable as being in this main room and we're so glad you're worshiping with us so please join us Easter morning to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus best day ever, right? Let's go. You don't want to miss it. Now, the week after Easter, we begin our next round of the next class. So it's a three-week class taking place April 7th, 14th, and 21st in the cafe after the 11 a.m. service, all three weeks. And this is the place to go as you consider your next step in your faith journey. 
This three-week class is designed to give you tangible, applicable action steps to grow in your walk with Jesus, to grow in your walk with his disciples, and to grow in your discipleship at this church. Uh, lunch and child care are provided, so we do ask that you RSVP. You can do that, of course, online, capitalchurch.com, or in the Capital Church app. Um, whether you've been at Capital for a really long time and you're looking to make those next steps, or this is your very first weekend, you should sign up for next it's going to be a great fit for you. Now, finally, pull out your message notes card in the seat back in front of you or grab it online so you can take notes for your sermon-based small group on today's message. Thank you so much for being here. Hi, friends. Thanks again for coming to church. And thanks to those of you who are joining us online. We're thrilled you're here as well. Today, we continue a series looking at the life and lyrics of David. We're following David as God calls this young shepherd from Bethlehem to become the shepherd of a nation. And along the way, we're overhearing some of David's prayers as we study some of David's psalms. Before we return to David's story today, let's turn to God and invite him to shape our story. Will you pray with me? Lord, I pray you bring fresh revelation from familiar narration. Lord, may you take a story many of us have heard as children and from it help us find the childlike faith we need to thrive in any and every circumstance. For my friends who face uncertainty in their story, may you meet them here in this story. For my friends who, who face a threat that's bigger than they are, May the words we read together remind them, nothing's bigger than you. We pray this in the name of King Jesus. Amen. Amen. The year was 1987. I awoke one morning to find the roads covered with a sheet of ice. See, I grew up in a suburb of Oklahoma City, and we didn't get a lot of snowstorms in Oklahoma. We got a lot of ice storms. After an ice storm, every road and every sidewalk and every car was covered with a thick layer of ice. Now, you can't make snow castles after an ice storm. You can't do anything after an ice storm, but stay inside and wait for it to warm up enough for the Arctic armor covering the earth to melt away. But during one such storm, my oldest friend in the world, Bill McDowell, and I had a brilliant idea that was certain to chase away the doldrums of a city in lockdown. You see, we had two assets available to us. The first was a wooden sled with metal runners, and the second was Bill's Jeep CJ7 Laredo. You see, Bill lived in the country, he lived in Logan County, where the roads didn't get a lot of traffic, but boasted rolling hills that felt like a roller coaster if you drove fast enough over them. So here was our idea. If we take a rope, attach one end of the rope to the sled, and the other end to the hitch of his Jeep, we could create our own great glacial ice coaster. And that's exactly what we did. Now, we did it with the blessing of our fathers, which may sound like parental negligence to our contemporary ears. But you got to understand, those were different times. In those days, seatbelts were used to tie down cargo, not passengers, okay? <laughs> of course, we, we didn't have helmets, but we had a sturdy rope. And we discovered the back roads of Logan County felt a lot more like a roller coaster when you experience them mere inches from the Earth's surface as ice particles and gravel are flying in your face. Now, Bill and I were pretty responsible. We rightly discerned that we could control the sled's trajectory just enough to steer it away from oncoming traffic. But there were two things we didn't think about in advance. First, we didn't realize when the metal runners of the sled come into contact with the bare concrete, 
sparks would fly, literally. (laughs) Second, and this was arguably more important, we never figured out how to stop the sled (laughs) until we did. (laughs) Friends, today I want to talk to you about fear. Now, some might say that Bill and I were fearless, but I can tell you we weren't fearless. If anything, we were reckless, or at least careless. But that's not fearlessness. See, I'm looking for something more helpful to me than carelessness, than the carelessness we often label fearless. I'm looking for courage to do what I'm afraid to do. Karl Barth offered a more theological understanding of courage. He said, courage is fear that said its prayers. <laughs> Today, I want to talk to you about fear. And to do so, we'll examine one of the best-known stories in human history, the story of David and Goliath. In his great book on David called Leap Over a Wall, the late Eugene Peterson offers his observations of the story's familiarity, and he invites us to step into the story with him. Peterson observes, the story of David and Goliath is one of the greatest of all children's stories. It's the first full-blown story about David and the most memorable. If you know anything at all about David, you know the story of Goliath. People who've never read the Bible, people who've never so much as heard that there is a Bible, know the story of David and Goliath. But once we've learned the story and assimilated the meaning that goes with it, the story isn't over and done with. Learning stories isn't the same as learning the multiplication tables. Once we've learned that three times four equals 12, we've learned it and that's that. It's a fact that doesn't change. The data is stored in our memory for ready access. But stories don't stay put. They grow and deepen. The meaning doesn't exactly change, but it matures. Having learned the meaning of love, for instance, we don't for a moment suppose that we've passed the course and can now go on to other things, deciding perhaps to sign up for computer science. No, we keep on telling stories, the same old ones, over and over and over again, in a way quite different from saying the multiplication tables over and over again. The stories keep releasing new insight in new situations. As we bring new experience and insight to the story, the story gathers that enrichment in and gives it back to us in fresh form. And so it turns out, that the David and Goliath story is as important for adults as it ever was for children. Today, while we talk about fear, we got to talk about trust. And in fact, I'm, I'm going to invite you to identify where you've placed your trust because you may not trust what you think you trust. I, I love teaching about trust It's a recurring theme in the scriptures and a recurring theme in my messages. Now, as I identify trust as a motif in my messages, I don't want to give you the impression that I'm any good at it. I'm still learning. Of course, there are certain segments of the journey with Jesus in which I excel at trust. For me, get this, when utter calamity strikes, I'm cool as a cucumber. Really, if life is coming undone, I find hope and strength knowing I'm in God's hands. Ironically, my lack of faith lurks in the day-to-day, the week-to-week struggles of deadlines and to-do lists. I race about as if God has given me too many assignments but too little time. And my friends, if you dig deep enough into my soul, you'd probably find it's due to a lack of trust, or more accurately, my misplaced trust. M- most of you know I've been heavily influenced by the life and leadership of the late Dallas Willard. I've just returned from spending a week with some of his closest friends. So naturally, Dallas's wisdom has been on my mind. 
But, but there's a particular piece of Dallas's advice that, that has shaped my journey with Jesus more than almost everything else he said. I, I shared it with you briefly during the last week of our Cycle of Grace series. I want to share it again now. Here it is. Don't trust your best. Do your best and trust God. I know I shared it with you just a few weeks ago, but, but I believe it bears repeating because th- in this humble statement, we find an explanation for 98% of my soul's anguish. A- and I really wanted to use it in a message like this so that I could talk Kelly into drawing it by hand so that I could display it on a big screen in my office to remind myself. Don't trust your best, Troy. Do your best and trust God. The story of David shows us these paths in contrast. We'll begin by reading in 1 Samuel 17, verse 1. Now the Philistines gathered their forces for war and assembled at Soka and Judah. They pitched camp at Ephes Damin between Soka and Azekah. Saul and the Israelites assembled and camped in the valley of Elah and drew up their battle line to meet the Philistines. The Philistines occupied one hill and the Israelites another with the valley between them. King Saul leads the armies of Israel to face the Philistines. The purpose of the battle is to obtain control of the Valley of Elah, which was the entry point between the two kingdoms. See, securing this valley guaranteed strategic advantage to the conquering country. Now, earlier in 1 Samuel, we learned from our narrator the primary reason the Israelites wanted a king in the first place was to defeat the Philistines. Well, that plan doesn't appear to be working. Verse 4, a champion named Goliath, who was from Goth, came out of the Philistine camp. Now, the Hebrew word translated champion is more literally man of the between. That'll make more sense in a moment. Our narrator informs us his height was six cubits and a span. Now, a cubit is not a precise measurement. It's the distance between the elbow and the tip of the middle finger, which is about 18 inches. A span is a distance between the tip of of the thumb and a tip of the little finger when a hand is spread out, which is about nine inches. The New International Version footnote tells us that is about nine feet, nine inches, or about three meters. That's a very tall guy. Some ancient translations lower the number. Certain versions of the Septuagint reduce the number to four cubits in a span, making him six, six. And honestly, there's no way to know for sure. Uh, But the size uh, of his armor and weaponry lean toward the reading of the traditional Hebrew text. Both ancient and modern history attest to gigantism, which we know today is a dysfunction of the pituitary gland that caused someone to grow beyond normal size. The, our narrator adds this. He says he had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armor of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. You know, often when we read Old Testament narratives, the writers give terse descriptions of characters. But here, this writer patiently describes this hulk of a man in greater detail than perhaps any other text in the Bible. Goliath is armed to the teeth in exotic battle dress. His breastplate alone weighs 5,000 shekels, which is about 125 pounds. That's like going into battle with a person strapped to your chest. On his legs, he wore bronze greaves, and a bronze javelin was slung on his back. The greaves covered his calves, while the javelin was probably a scimitar from East Asia. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod, and its iron point weighed 600 shekels. His shield bearer went ahead of him. The spear is, com- is, is compared to a weaver's beam, which means it's really thick. The tip of the spear called a flame was made of iron and weighed 600 shekels, which is about 15 pounds. A cord was attached to the spear, which allowed a skilled thrower to hurl it with the spin, letting it fly further faster. And the shield carried by the shield bearer was of the type that covered the entire body. Needless to say, Goliath is an intimidating figure. Verse 8. 
Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And are you not the servants of Jesus, or servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Uh, Both people groups believe that warfare was first and foremost a contest between their gods. So why not avoid senseless bloodshed by conducting a contest of champions? Now this practice was not unheard of in the ancient Near East. I noted earlier the word champion meant man of the between, referring to the space between the two armies. He's the middleman or the intermediary who would represent his people. Goliath Goliath offers his challenge, but no one from Saul's army responds. Then the Philistine said, this day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistine's words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. Now the Israelite army is outmatched to begin with. Modern archaeological excavations have shown that the Philistines were an advanced society. That their work with iron was particularly noteworthy. They were especially gifted blacksmiths, which was not a skill mastered yet by the Israelites. That meant that these iron workers probably came to battle with better weapons. No wonder our narrator tells us the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. Dismayed is the word chatat in Hebrew, which conveys a dire condition. Literally, the word means shattered. Saul and his army, and in fact, all of his army, are utterly dismayed and frozen in terror. We often see those two words paired together in the Hebrew Bible, dismayed, terrified. We often experience those two words together in everyday life. I bet more than a few of you are facing a giant-sized crisis right now. Maybe you're in financial trouble. Maybe your grades are tanking. Maybe your performance is plummeting. You've prayed every prayer. You've done everything you know to do, but right now you face a very uncertain tomorrow. Maybe you realize you are in an unhealthy relationship, but you're afraid to break it off with her because she might be your last shot at marriage. And besides, it's not like there's a long line of women waiting behind her. You're frozen in indecision. You're dismayed and terrified. And have you noticed, fear is contagious. We pass it along from friend to friend, from parent to child. We pass on our fear of failure, our fear of being rejected, our fear of growing old, our fear of becoming insignificant. The fear of King Saul spreads among the soldiers. But then the narrative shifts abruptly about 15 miles eastward. Verse 12, now David was the son of an Ephrathite named Jesse, who was from Bethlehem in Judah. Jesse had eight sons, and in Saul's time he was very old. Jesse's three oldest sons had followed Saul to war. The firstborn was Eliab, the second Abinadab, and the third Shammah. David was the youngest. The three oldest followed Saul, but David went back and forth from Saul to tend his father's sheep at Bethlehem. If, If you know David's story, You know, he was already annoying the king of Israel instead of his brothers. But David's still not treated like Jesse's other sons, probably because he's so young. For 40 days, the Philistine came forward every morning and evening and took his stand. Oh, the author doesn't want us to forget what's going on in that west. Goliath's taunts continue twice a day for well over a month. As each day passes, the Israelite army becomes more discouraged. Every word from the mouth of the warrior leaves them petrified in their tents, utterly hopeless. Maybe you've been staring your giant in the face for so long, your hopes have been away too. But but whether you realize it or not, you're making a choice in your response to your crisis. You're making a decision to respond either in fear 
or in faith. King Saul's overwhelmed with the size of his foe. He's shaken to his core. His imagination has become so filled up with the Philistine warrior, there is no room for God. He lies awake at night, awaiting the booming voice of Goliath the next morning. He is living in dread. Verse 17, now Jesse said to his son David, take this ephah of roasted grain and these 10 loaves of bread for your brothers and hurry to their camp. You can tell Jesse's worried because he tells his youngest to hurry. Take along these 10 cheeses to the commander of their unit. See how your brothers are and bring back some assurance from them. Assurance refers to some kind of token or pledge, something that visibly assures the father that his boys are all right. Well, David will bring something back to show Papa. It's just not what he's expecting. Jesse explains, they, meaning David's brothers, are with Saul and all the men of Israel in the valley of Elah fighting against the Philistines. Jesse's words are probably intended to put David in his place again, reminding him he's too young to go to war with the king. Verse 20, early in the morning, David left the flock in the care of a shepherd, loaded up and set out as Jesse had directed. Now notice how God uses everyday circumstances to get his man in the right place at the right time to accomplish his plan. Jesse gives an order, but God works through that order. After David travels about 15 miles west, he reached the camp as the army was going out to its battle positions, shouting the war cry. Israel and the Philistines were drying up their lines, facing each other. The narrator's words in Hebrew carefully call attention to God's perfect timing. David arrives just as they go out. David left his things with the keeper of supplies, ran to the battle lines, and asked his brothers how they were. As he was talking to them, let me stop right there. Note again the timing of God. Every moment seems carefully orchestrated. As he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Goth, stepped out from his lines and shouted his usual defiance. And David heard it. Whenever the Israelites saw the man, they all fled from him in great fear. That's the same word translated terror in verse 11. Apparently over these 40 days, the cowardly king of Israel has been searching without success for a champion among his troops. Well, as the psychological warfare continues, Saul apparently sweetens the deal. Now the Israelites had been saying, do you see how this man keeps coming out? He comes out to defy Israel. The king will give great wealth to the man who kills him. He will also give him his daughter in marriage and will exempt his family from taxes in Israel. Do you think Jesse would like one of his boys to bring this home from the battlefield. Uh, you got to understand this tax exemption would cover father and brothers as well as slaves and laborers. It, it could cover as many as 50 to 100 people. This is the talk among the soldiers, but David hasn't heard it yet. So, verse 26, David asked the man standing near him, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of God? Now, I don't know if you've noticed, but not until this moment has anyone even mentioned God. It's as if the faith of the Israelites has evaporated. David and the soldiers are looking at the same situation differently. The soldiers referred to Goliath as this man who defies Israel, David sees him as an uncircumcised Philistine who dares to defy the armies of the living God. David sees this as a deeply theological problem. He's indignant that someone could profane God's name in such a way. Elohim Chaim, the living God, the God of Israel is alive. Unlike the God of gods of the Philistines, those lifeless idols in which they put their trust. Are you worrying like there is no God? Waiting for a job, waiting for a spouse. Are you waiting with anticipation or agnosticism? Verse 27, they repeated to him what they'd been saying and told him, this is what, what will be done for the man who kills him. 
A boy, perhaps a teenager, asks the most courageous question heard in the camp in 40 days. But look how his brother responds when Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with the men. He burned with anger at him and asked, why have you come down here? And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch the battle. Now what have I done, said David? Can I even speak? To our contemporary ears, David sounds a little whiny. Well, excuse me. He then turned away to someone else and brought up the same manner. And the men answered him as before. What David said was overheard and reported to Saul, and Saul sent for him. David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Get this, David tries to encourage King Saul. But how much courage could Saul draw from the daring declaration of a hobbit? Saul replied, you are not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You are only a young man, and he has been a warrior from his youth. Now, this is a sensible response, right? At least from a person who sees power and prowess through the eyes of the world. Saul's words are emphatic. You are only boy. He is a man of war. In comparison, David's just a pup. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Lions and bears were common in that region at this time period. Literally, David says, I seized it by the beard. Picture a young shepherd grasping a lion by its mane. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he's defied the armies of the living God. Bold words. But in case there's any confusion about who conquered the wild beasts, young David clarifies, the Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. Now, notice the balance of David's belief. Yes, David rescued the lamb, but God rescued David. And, and David trusted God would do it again. See, there's something beyond self-confidence here. His courage is rooted in faith. And it's our first glimpse of the contrast between David and Saul. Somewhere along the way, David learned, don't trust your best. Do your best and trust God absolutely give life your best throw yourself into your career work hard play hard plan hard you owe it to yourself and you owe it to god colossians 3 23 says whatever you do work at it with all your heart by all means give it your all just don't trust your all saul said to david go and the lord be with you now over the years I've noticed this phrase is often spoken to people in the Bible who have a good reason to panic. The Lord is with you. It's actually the most beautiful thing you or I could experience along the journey of life. A sense that God is with us wherever we go, whatever we're doing. How differently would you respond to the circumstances of life if you were confident that God was with you? By by the way, Are you surprised little David convinces King Saul to let him fight Goliath? Remember what happens if David loses. If David loses, Saul submits to the Philistines and Israel's enslaved again. The stakes are high. How did this kid convince this king to let him become Israel's representative warrior? Well, earlier, I said fear is contagious. So is faith. Then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. 
The king's armor is surely the finest armor Israel has to offer. And, and Saul want, wants to provide David with, with every possible hope of success. Saul's helmet is made of bronze, the same material as Goliath's helmet, which was probably not worn by, by many soldiers in Israel. Wouldn't a bronze helmet offer David the best protection in such circumstances? Verse 39, David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. Remember in 1 Samuel 9, Saul is described as being a head taller from everyone else in Israel. In 1 Samuel 16, our narrator implies David was the runt of the litter. We are intended to see the humor of this scene as David appears puny, peeking out from under the king's coat of armor. I cannot go in these, he said to Saul, because I'm not used to them. So he took them off. And he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with his sling in hand, approached the Philistine. David walks to the riverbed and selects five smooth stones. And those stones are courage, <laughs> faith, <laughs> integrity. Sorry, that's an inside joke. I, I think too much has been made of the five smooth stones over the years. However, I do wonder, why five? Now, I don't see deep significance in the number, but I think it's safe to say David wasn't sure how this thing would shake out. He wasn't certain this would be over with one stone. Perhaps this is an example of David doing his best without trusting his best. He's working from experience. The lion turned on him after he struck it with the stone. Goliath's likely to do the same. So David brings a few extra. Why not 10 stones? Well, David probably surmised if the job wasn't done in five, he'd be done in five. <laughs> so five will have to do. <laughs> Meanwhile, the Philistine with his shield bearer in front of him kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was a little more than a boy, glowing with health and handsome, and he despised him. As Goliath inches closer, he looks down on young David with hatred. He's especially incensed because David's a pretty little boy who just put on his shoes and socks. <laughs> he said to David, am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Dogs, by the way, were, were not highly regarded in their world. People didn't dress them in little sweater vests. And cursing David by his gods, we see the ancient way of calling for a god's help, invoking that god's power. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. Friends, this is what we might call ancient Semitic trash talk. <laughs> to die without burial was a despicable act of dishonor in the Near East. But this is what the Philistine promises. You want to see a cool literary element in the story? In Hebrew, verses 41 through 44 repeat the same subject in each sentence over and over again, the Philistine. The NIV doesn't preserve this effect because the translators wanted to smooth out the language in English to be true to their translational philosophy. But, but you'll see the effect in other translations like the ESV. And the Philistine moved forward and came near to David with the shield bearer in front of him. And when the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. And the Philistine said to David, am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the field. The writer repeats the subject again and again to slow down the narrative. It's a literary device that imitates the lumbering steps of the giant. Contrasted with the speedy preparation of our hero. David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. 
It's an emphatic declaration of trust. You come against me with this sword, I come against you with a name. Poor Goliath. David turns Goliath's curse back on him. This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hands and I'll strike you down and cut off, cut off your head. This very day I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. Now there are two reasons God will do this. First, he, he wants the whole world to know that there is one God, the God of the armies of Israel. The second purpose is found in verse 47. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord's and he will give all of you into our hands. David's people had a lesson to learn about the Lord here. And some of us might need to learn it as well. Don't trust your best. Do your best and trust God. See, for me, I found a simple litmus test that helps me to determine if I'm doing my best or trusting my best. Here it is. If I'm stressed, I'm trusting my best. Shakespeare it ain't. But, it, but it's proven to be true in my soul. If I'm stressed, I'm trusting my best. You know, some of us wear stress like a badge. We're proud of it. As, as if you should admire me for being stressed because somehow that makes me important. But the fact of the matter is, my stress says less about the importance of my life and more about the impotence of my faith. Hear me, my fellow driven disciples. You don't get any points for being more stressed than the rest of us. You're just showing us you don't trust Jesus enough to relax. Let's return to David's story, verse 48. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down on the ground. Th then the author interrupts the story slow to make an editorial comment he doesn't want us to miss. Verse 50, so David triumphed over the Philistine with the sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. Back to the valley. David ran and stood over him. He took hold of the Philistine's sword and drew it from the sheath. After he killed him, he cut off his head with the sword. The, the, the Hebrew text is more ambiguous than the NIV implies. We don't know if it was the stone or the sword that ultimately killed Goliath. Either way, we can't overlook the irony of David using the Philistine's own weapon to decapitate him. When the Philistines saw their hero was dead, they turned and ran. Well, apparently the deal is off. There's no surrender to submission. The stunned Philistines flee in terror. Then the men of Israel and Judah surged forward with a shout and pursued the Philistines to the entrance of Gath and to the gates of Akron. Their dead were strewn along the Sha'arin road to Gath and Akron. I want to pause right here. From our modern viewpoint, it's hard not to wince when we read words like this in the Old Testament. I mean, how can they celebrate so much violence? And friends, that's especially true in our day. And we need to be very, very careful and very, very wise when we start to take these biblical texts from 3,000 years ago and apply them to today's world in our geopolitics. May God give us wisdom. And let's have a lot more humility. With me? When we come to these texts, we gotta remember the people of the ancient Near East equated military strength with the strength of their nation's deity. And, and God spoke in David's day, in David's way, and that's why things are written like this, okay? Verse 53, when the Israelites returned from chasing the Philistines. They plundered their camp. Finally, David took the Philistines' head and brought it to Jerusalem. He put the Philistines' weapon in his own tent. 
now. That's the story of David and Goliath. Let's bring this into our world. And we should be careful here because we often get this wrong in application. The conventional application of the David and Goliath story is be brave and go get them because you got this girl. (laughs) And hear me, if you needed a self-help tip today, then I hope you got it. But some of us are beyond the help of self-help. We we need something bigger than us to help us. And that makes sense if you think about it. Michelle Couchat says, a boat anchored to itself is not anchored at all. When we read 1 Samuel 17, the narrator intends us to see the contrast of the two kings, David and Saul. David walked in faith. Saul walked in fear. But but Saul's ideal solution wasn't simply to run out and face his fear. We should seek to understand why Saul was afraid. See, Saul's fear doesn't necessarily mean he lacked faith. It just means he put his faith in the wrong thing. Faith in the wrong thing eventually gives way to fear. Or we could say it this way. Fear comes from misplaced trust. What did Saul trust? Saul trusted physical prowess. Saul trusted military experience. Saul trusted military equipment, sword, shield, helmets. Now, Saul's faith in those things got him a long way in life. And faith in those things worked well for Saul. Until it didn't. It works well to put your faith in talent until you realize you're not the most talented. It works well to put your faith in good looks until you grow old. It works well to put your faith in your strength until you face a problem that's stronger than you. See, Saul got used to being the tallest guy in the room. But then he met Goliath. Goliath was greater. He had better weapons. He had greater self-esteem. Both Saul and Goliath put their faith in the wrong things. And it didn't work out well for either of them. Faith in the wrong thing eventually gives way to fear if you live long enough. So let me ask, what do your fears tell you about your faith? Do you fear conflict? Do you fear failure? Do you fear failure? Are you afraid to disappoint people? Are you terrified of looking stupid? What was your fear? I'll tell you about your faith. Specifically, where you've placed it. Dallas said, don't trust your best. Do your best. Trust God. Friends, take take account of the damage done when you live in fear. Consider how your fear of failure drives you to work ridiculous hours while your friends and family are neglected. Consider how your fear of being alone drives you into relationships with guys who draw you away from God. Consider how your fear of disappointing people prevents you from saying no to your boss, from saying no to your boyfriend, from saying no to your children. What if we took heed of the words of our friend Dallas Willard? Don't trust your best. Do your best. And trust God. Bow your heads with me. In a moment, I'm going to pray, but I want to give you a moment to reflect. Ask yourself, what are you afraid of? Maybe you want to ask God to help you identify what you're afraid of. Take a moment in this silence. Answer that question to yourself. Lord, I pray you help us get honest about our fears.
Help us to get vulnerable with you and with your people enough that we can get real and identify the things that we're really afraid of because our fears are driving us to do dumb things and say dumb things. And, and we and the people around us are paying a price for that. But I also pray you help us to identify what our fears are saying about our faith and where we placed it. Now, some of us in our fear of failure have got to recognize that we've been worshiping the God of success. Some of us who have a dread of not having enough have worshipped at the altar of money. Lord, help us to recognize what our people-pleasing says about our faith. How we contort our, our, our words and our wills to make the people around us happy. Maybe it's not people, maybe it's one person. And may we recognize that person cannot be our God. That person cannot be the source of our well-being. That may only be found in you. Lord, help us to recognize you love us so much and you're so good we can put our trust in you no matter what we face and I pray you take this wonderful old story of David and apply it in new ways to our world today help us to get out of our fear And, and really trust you trust you in a way that really matters trust you in a way that changes the way we sleep at night trust you in a way that impacts how present we are to our loved ones we find we can be present because our trust is not in our best it's in you and Lord I pray for my friends here who who Maybe they don't know you well. They're searching, they're seeking, they're curious. Maybe they're watching online and they, they wonder what all this, this could look like to find their own journey of faith. Lord, I pray for them that their heart would be open to see your love for them, your, your good character, and may they put their trust in you and trust you with their whole lives. I pray that for them. I'll pray that for all of us. And maybe we'll pray the prayer of that fearful father from the Gospel of Mark who prayed that wonderfully honest and wonderfully helpful prayer. I believe, help my unbelief. Lord, I do trust you. Help me in the areas I don't. Give me and my friends here a special grace of faith. We pray this in the name of the King. Amen. Amen. Okay, friends, I got a little homework for you. Here's your first assignment. Um, and really, I'm gonna keep this simple today. I want to encourage you to spend a little time in Psalm 56 this week. Okay? Now, Psalm 56 is written in a different season of David's life. Okay? Similarly to 1 Samuel 17, David is utterly outmatched. However, unlike the David of 1 Samuel 17, the David of Psalm 66 is afraid. Get this? Later in life, he's afraid. In other words, this doesn't necessarily get better with age. Now, no more than a few years have passed since Goliath, 
But David's circumstances have utterly shifted. He's lost his support system. Life has worn him down and spread him thin. David is running for his life, not just from the armies of the Philistines. David is running from Saul and the armies of Israel. I'll say more about that later in the series. But, but here's why David is particularly afraid when he writes Psalm 56. The heading of the psalm tells us that David wrote this song when the Philistines had seized him in Goth. Picture this, David's all alone, he's on the run, and he's captured. He's taken as a prisoner in Goth. Who, who do we know who came from Goth? Goliath. But now the famous giant slayer, David, finds himself alone and apprehended by the rule of Goliath's hometown. How's that gonna work? Later in 1 Samuel 21, we'll, we'll read about David's emotion. After hearing the taunts of the people of Goth, verse 12 says, David took these words to heart and was very much afraid of Achish, king of Goth. I don't think the narrator of Samuel ever mentions David's fear except when he seized at Goth. These are dark days, and David's terrified. And remember, David's got a good reason to be terrified if his faith is in his ability to fight the king of God. So get this. This is why this psalm is helpful. When David sees his fear, he does something utterly brilliant in verse three. He says, when I am afraid, I put my trust in you. When David's afraid, he recognizes his trust is misplaced. He's trusting in chariots and horses, spears and swords. Maybe Psalm 56 will help you get a little perspective on your problems this week. Here's a book I want to recommend. I'll recommend it throughout the series called Leap Over a Wall by Eugene Peterson. I read from it a little earlier. I'll continue to read snippets from it throughout this series. Uh, pick it up. Maybe you want to read along and study along with us as, as we work through the David story in the, in the days ahead. Stand with me. Here's a verse for you, my friends. It's the one I just read, Psalm 56, verse 3. When I'm afraid, I put my trust in you. Some of us would do well to put that on our phone's home screen to remind us, to remind us, to remind us and give us perspective. The, the image on the screen and the graphic that follows will be available. You can watch for them on our website. We'll upload them soon. Uh, it, it, as always, if you'd like to receive prayer, there will be people here at the front to pray for you, make your weapon. If I'm to do so, you can always send us an email, care at capitalchurch.com. It goes especially for those of you who are watching online. We're, we're thrilled that all of you are, are part of what God's doing at Capitol. This is my prayer for you, friends. May you find the faith to do your best without trusting your best because you have put your trust in God. Thanks for coming today. Grace and peace.